Hi, I'm the Space Quest historian. Well, I guess you can call this a stroke of catastrophic irony, because having now played all of the eight official installments of Sierra's King's Quest series, I now find myself right back where I fucking started, playing King's Quest 1, or Quest for the Crown, as it's now been subtitled. And the reason for that is, back when I made my video on King's Quest 1, I neglected to take into account any of the myriad of alternate versions this game has. That video was made before I started doing what I now effectually termed the bonus round, which is where I look at different ports and versions of the same game and compare them for, well, shits and giggles mainly, and this is something I didn't start doing until I made my King's Quest 2 video. And it's honestly a pity that I didn't, because King's Quest 1 has some really interesting versions to talk about. So in this video, I will atone for my lack of foresight and play three, well actually technically four, versions of this game that are wildly different. And no, I will not be taking a look at the AGI remake for DOS that came out in 1987, because that's literally just the PC Junior version in a different engine. I'm more interested in the weird and peculiar versions, like this version for the Sega Master System, which came out in 1989, five years after the original game was released. Now, why anyone thought it would be a good idea to do the original King's Quest game for the Master System, at a time when Sierra had already released the fourth King's Quest game a year earlier, which represented a quantum leap in terms of technology and presentation, is anyone's fucking guess. Maybe they thought the demographic of console players were finally ready to experience the Murder by Moon Logic puzzle design of the 19th classic. Now, to be fair, the console market was no stranger to bafflingly idiotic puzzles, but a lot of times these were either due to bad translations, like this infamous tornado puzzle in Simon's Quest, or because the developers intentionally made the games harder so players who rented the cartridges over the weekends wouldn't be able to finish them. We've all heard the stories. But King's Quest is brutal by design. It may have been expected fair for PC users back in the mid-80s when the average player was likely out of college and had a steady paycheck, but video games at the end of the 80s were still considered to be children's toys. And with a PC you could at least pretend you were using it for productivity and playing games was just something you were doing in your off time, but you can't really pretend like you're doing your fucking taxes with a fucking gamepad in your hand. You'd think, therefore, that they would at least make some small concessions to the more egregious examples of mental fist-fucking that this game can dish out, and you would be absolutely wrong. The gnome puzzle is still as bafflingly obtuse as ever, and it still relies on you misspelling his goddamn name because no one bothered to look up how to actually spell Rumpelstiltskin. And you can still dead-end yourself within a matter of minutes because Graham can apparently murder goats from several feet away with the power of his mind. And the game doesn't even so much as ask if you're really sure that this is a good idea, or, come to think of it, supply any rational explanation for why it would even give you the option since the goat is absolutely no threat to you and you need it to get past the bridge troll. Thank fuck I was playing this on an emulator, not an actual Sega Master System back in the late 80s, because once again, your only hope of going back without having to restart the whole game from scratch is by using this rat bastard password system and HOLY CHRIST, DO YOU THINK YOU HAVE ENOUGH CHARACTERS IN THIS SHIT? MY FUCKING GOD. And you'd think replacing the parser with the pseudo point and clickish verb noun construction circus up here would at least make the game more easy to play? I mean, at least there's no more bashing your head against the dumb fuck parser trying to work out which words it'll accept, right? Well, to be honest, I never really thought the parser presented much of a problem in the first King's Quest game. This new interface, though, can piss right the fuck off. While it's sort of novel for the verb list to be contextual depending on what objects are in the scene, it is rendered massively confusing by having all of your inventory items mixed in with a list of objects in the current scene. And also, it's wildly inconsistent. Whereas Graham can apparently will a goat to death from several feet away, he can't turn the crank on a well unless he's standing close enough for it to poke his eye out. And the game will offer no explanation as to why, not even the dreaded you're not close enough. Now, it'll just cross its arms like a petulant child and go, nuh -uh. In fact, the game is laughably short on any helpful dialogue at all. It's bizarre how few look messages there are, and the standard generic response of you see nothing special leads to a slew of unintentionally comical situations where Graham is face to face with a fire spewing dragon, a throne room full of leprechauns, and a magical beanstalk that just sprouted hundreds of feet into the air within seconds, not to mention the ruling monarch of the whole kingdom, and he finds absolutely nothing special about any of it. The only time the look verb is even used is when you need to look at something to reveal another object, like the pouch of diamonds in the tree stump. Any other time, regardless of how fantastically implausible or impressive something is, Graham has absolutely no opinion and no interest in it. And this goes against every instinct an adventure game player has, because we're taught to always look at something before messing with it, precisely because of games like King's Quest, who delights in punishing you for not being careful enough. 
And not only that, but the game has bugged up the ass. If you position him just right, Graham is able to scale the throne room walls like he's goddamn Spider-Man. And the fairy godmother here is apparently so offended that I scoot past her because I don't need her stupid fucking protection spell at this point, that she causes the game to freak out and shit itself into an unholy compost pile of garbled pixels. Either that or this is Graham's first overdose come to life. Either way, I had to reset the whole emulator after this. Still, you gotta hand it to Sega. I don't remember the giant's death being this gory, but I'm not complaining. Fatality. Needless to say, this whole endeavor of playing King's Quest on the Sega Master System was a trip and a half, and a fairly interesting curiosity, but as a gaming experience, it's utterly pointless, and it's honestly a mystery to me why they thought anyone would ever buy this. The Master System was on its last legs when this came out anyway, and it would only be a year later that Sierra themselves would release this, the official SCI remake of King's Quest 1. This completely remade version runs on the then new SCI version that was introduced with King's Quest 4. It's twice the resolution, well, at least horizontally, and it's, well, it's got the same amount of colors, but it really was a technological leap forward, not least of which in the audio department, because sound cards were now a thing, and this remake boasts a fantastic music score by Ken Allen, who, well, you know, Space Quest 4. Need I say more? The in-game text and dialogue has also been greatly expanded and in some cases rewritten, courtesy of none other than Josh Mandel. What? the unsung hero of Sierra Online. Now, I've mentioned this before, but Josh was the go-to guy at Sierra if you needed any clever or funny flavor text in your game. He ghost-wrote narration for everything from Space Quest 4 to Gabriel Knight 1, but this King's Quest 1 remake was his first stab at a game, and he's credited too. The one stipulation was that everything he did had to pass Roberta's inspection and approval, but to her credit, she pretty much let Josh do whatever he wanted with very little interference. One of the subtle changes that Josh made was to justify Graham's quest by making the three magical items stolen rather than just items the ruling king expected him to go swipe. In the original game, Graham is basically off to steal other people's shit, whereas in this version he's reclaiming them and bringing them back to their rightful owner. Sounds noble, right? It does raise some further questions though, chiefly if King Edward here had a magic mirror that could foretell the future, why didn't it warn him that some asshole dragon was about to steal it from under his nose? How did the big lumbering giant manage to sneak in unnoticed and make off with a chest full of money? And more to the point, what exactly does he want with it? It's not like Daventry is a bustling economy, tree trunks with diamond pouches in them notwithstanding, and the giant honestly doesn't strike me as being particularly bright. From the looks of it, it seems like he's just carrying it around like a pet rock. The only thing that makes sense that someone would steal is the magic shield which the leprechauns have made off with, and honestly, they look like they need it more than Graham does. The Kingdom of Daventry isn't exactly in any danger of being overrun by hostile forces anytime soon. I mean, what would be the point? You've got a population of five humanoid inhabitants, two of which are starving to death, and another turns people into candy for shits and giggles, plus a wolf, an old goat, and a subterranean society of Irish stereotypes. Now call me crazy, but aside from the chest full of endless gold, which Edward somehow managed to lose anyway, there's not much here that's Screams valuable conquest to me. But anyway, at least we're no longer just invading people's throne rooms and caves and magical hiking grounds in the sky to steal shit that doesn't really belong to us. Except we can still make off with the Leprechaun King's Scepter for reasons I don't think even Graham is entirely clear on. Otherwise, it's pretty much still the exact same game, including this rat bastard eagle jumping puzzle that can seriously go to hell. On the bright side, Rumble Dickskin's puzzle here has been made significantly easier since it now accepts his name backwards as the correct solution, assuming you still spell it wrong, of course, instead of having to go through the whole batshit alphabet substitution exercise. And the throne room of King Edward has certainly livened up since last time we saw it. There are actually people here to witness the king keel over and die, so it doesn't just look like Graham took the old bastard out while he wasn't looking and stole the crown. The downside of this, of course, is that it also illustrates a tragic class divide when all the rich assholes apparently live inside the castle walls and are seemingly indifferent to the grueling hardships of the world outside. I mean, come on, you dickweeds, you got people literally starving to death a couple hundred yards away. Eh, what do you care? Anyway, that's it for the official versions, at least those I'm interested in, that diverge significantly from the original PC Junior release. Sure, there's also an Apple II GS version that has digital sound effects and extra music, but you know, I had to skim through a playthrough on YouTube, and it's exactly the same game otherwise. Although the looping sound effect of the river is so hilariously short, it sounds like there's construction work going on in the background. Also, this utterly pathetic bump when the goat pushes the troll into the river. And horrifyingly, this scream as you bravely push an elderly woman into an oven and burn her alive. 
And hey, there's actually something I didn't cover in my first video. You can kill the witch. Now, I tried getting this to work in the PC Junior version, but I could never get RNGs on my side and have her actually come home while I was in her house. And when I played the SCI remake, I had a protection spell, so the witch just fucked off when I barged into her house and stole her cheese. And I couldn't be fucked to try when I played the Master System version. But lo and behold, here's the VGA fan remake of King's Quest with Josh Mandel himself reprising his role as Graham. Take heart, my king. I shall not fail you. It was made by a group of fans who called themselves Tierra Entertainment, then AGD Interactive, short for Anonymous Game Developers, who finally became Himalaya Studios and released games like Mage's Initiation and Al Ammo and the Lost Dutchman's Mine. Anyway, here's Graham tossing an old woman into a bubbling cauldron and boiling her alive. With a mighty shove, you courageously push the Wicked Witch into the pot. Her wild screams are suddenly cut off as she melts away into the oily green slime. Congratulations! I still don't see what's so courageous about sneaking up behind someone and either boiling or burning them alive. Then again, murdering old women in their homes has become kind of a staple of the King's Quest games. In King's Quest 4, Rosella snuffs out a lot in her bed by shooting an arrow in her face. And in King's Quest Mask of Eternity, Connor brutally murders a swamp witch on her own porch for seemingly no other crime than she was in his way. Okay, so let's talk about this VGA fan remake. It's essentially a one-to-one -one remake of Sierra's official SCI remake, but with VGA graphics styled after what we saw in King's Quest V. In fact, Graham's sprite is literally lifted wholesale from the resource file in King's Quest V. Also, the original version of this remake used graphics from other VGA Sierra games stitched together to form new backgrounds, whereas the current version available for download now has all original background art, apparently because AGDI were told to knock it off by Vivendi back when they owned the rights to the Sierra library. Vivendi were actually sort of cool with people making fan games based on the Sierra properties, but one thing they insisted on was that they couldn't reuse art assets from existing games or something. I'm not entirely clear on why they let the Graham sprite from King's Quest V be, but hey, point of the matter is, all the backgrounds were redrawn, and they look fucking amazing. In fact, this is a really competent remake. It even gives you the option at the start to play without dead ends, which is a phenomenal addition. It basically removes all the situations where you can bone yourself into a dead man walking scenario, you know, when the game is still playing, but you will never be able to finish it for as long as you live unless you restart. I actually played both the original version with the stitched together art and the current version which has all the original artwork and is also fully voiced. The original version is pretty good too, although of course it has some beginner's kinks in it like here where Graham has spawned into the room outside a walkable area so now he's stuck here forever staring down a goat and unable to move. But on the plus side he can now telekinetically open gates. Also minor little unintentionally hilarious little touches like how the woodcutter tries to feed his dying wife by pouring piping hot stew down her cleavage. On the whole though, the AGDI remake is really good, if you thought the original SCI remake was really good, because for better or worse, it's exactly the same game except with a point and click interface instead of a parser. Now, one person who was a beta tester on this fan remake thought they could have done more than just a straight one-to-one -one remake of Sierra's own remake, like for instance have the story and its characters make some kind of sense rather than just being stock fantasy archetypes with no personality or backstory. And when he brought up this point to the developers, they responded by by saying, well, why don't you do it? That beta tester's name was Daniel Stacy, and when AGDI decided to tackle King's Quest II for their next remake project, Daniel was put in charge of designing and writing a vastly expanded story for that remake. And that's what I'll be taking a look at next, so brace yourselves! We're diving back into the drug-fueled ovary-hunting caper that was Romancing the Throne, or as Daniel renamed it, Romancing the Stones. I can only assume that the title is now a reference to Graham's royal blue balls. Anyway, we'll find out in the next video, so brace Brace yourselves, full steam ahead. I assure you, we're almost done with all this Daventry horse shit, so stick around. And until next time, I'll see you around the Chrono Stream. Bye!